Hey y'all, so this week we read Someone Has to Fail. Um, at first, I'm sure some of you guys had the same initial reaction as I did, that this felt like a pretty hard-handed and maybe a bit more negative view of education than most of us like to typically have. However, as I kept reading, I realized his point in be behind making it so heavy-handed because I think he's just calling us to attention of like actually dealing with these problems and um, kind of like the contradictions between what we see happening with reform versus what's actually happening in the schools and the problems that it leads to for the kids. And his point is that we for too long have it just like kind of let it stay on these two different paths. And then because of that, we're still in the same problem. So I want to start on page 11. He um, gives us a list of adjectives to describe the American Public education, he says, it's highly accessible, accessible, radically unequal, organizationally fragmented, and instructionally mediocre, which at first kind of makes main moves like, okay, dang, you think the school system's not doing anything good, but then as I broke it into each little section there, I'm like, well, he's right. Like, all of these statements are true in so many different ways, but how do we, why is this happening, and what can we do moving forward to maybe not make that so prominent? And so for the next bit, he in the second and third chapters, he walks us through this timeline of different um, movements within education. And I knew it had a little bit of a basis of those. I think in one of our early education classes, we had to learn a little bit about these movements. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time there. It was useful to see like how we got to where we are. But I want to skip to on page 21. Um, we have this idea of, okay, yes, education is supposed to be about learning, but it's become really saturated with preparing um, students for this, these market forces. So um, how much of education is just about learning and how much has it transformed into this just trying to be prepared to be employees um, in the market and where the problems with that kind of lie, which takes us to page 23. He says high school curriculum should be quite similar and the idea that High school curriculum should be quite similar in length and content for all students, whether or not they were heading to college. And for me, this was something, hi, Charlie, that was very, um, made a lot of sense to me from what I could see in um, what little I've seen of high school curriculum that last year I had a group of students who most of them weren't going to college and they struggled. They're like, well, why am I learning this if I'm not going to college? And like, where does this, why does this curriculum exist to help me? And this idea that it should be for all students and shouldn't be taught in any different variations felt very forced. And I could see where, and I think we've all seen where that actually ends up harming students and makes them feel um, not valued and just creates problems within them. Um, and so I think we can do a better job as a school system to create a curriculum that fits all of our students in a way that gives them the chance to succeed in whatever form or fashion they want, but doesn't feel like it's being pigeonholed to anything. Um, I'm going to spend the rest of my time uh, talking about chapter five, which was 134. Let me get there in my book. I'm sorry. Um, it was a chapter that was called Classroom Resistance to Reform. And I think this chapter stood out to me the most because it felt some of this felt hard for me to speak about because I haven't been in the school system, um, like part of the educational field long enough to really know what it's like to have reforms pushed down my neck um, as a teacher, but this chapter felt a little bit more um, applicable to what I might be seeing and feeling right now. So he starts the chapter by there's this difference between on um, teaching and learning. And I questioned here, why, why do we have this distinction and what are we doing wrong with the reforms that um, we're creating as a country that makes education not about learning and puts this pressure just to teach and impart this knowledge because we all know and there's so much theory behind that not being beneficial to anyone so why do we continue to have that distinction but what do we do to change that and that goes back to this idea that um th we're in a position as teachers that we succeed by our students succeeding uh, which i found was an interesting quote that he brings up because it is true, like teachers are measured by their success of the students, but then we have this, we have to realize that this measure of success has been dictated by 
the, the educational reform. And I think that's what he's saying is the problem that teachers feel this pressure to be measured by the success of their students and students feel this pressure to live up to this level of success for their teachers and for themselves, but it's a measure of success that doesn't fall in line with what the teachers or the students in the classroom actually maybe feel is successful. Um, it's these scores that are seen at right now, at least in education, as so successful. And that places pressures on both sides in the classroom that just feel unnatural. Hi, Blue. Um, so that, I think, is leading to some problems there. And then on page 138, we go back to this idea of this kind of switching gears, but control and classroom management being kind of interchangeable words. And I think all of us have heard a lot about like, oh, that's going to be the hardest thing as a young teacher. You're not going to be able to control your classroom. Like, what are you going to do about classroom management? Blah, 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 blah. I'm not discounting that we do need a sense of classroom management because we obviously do. But I think putting the world control in front of that seems I don't, I, for, I don't like that um, comparison because, yes, I need to be in control of the room, but I don't want to be controlling everything that my kids are doing. They need to exist as humans in this room. And I wrote down that this bringing control in with the idea of classroom management, I think, leads to this, you know, he, we have this teaching and then not learning happening. And a lot of what he talks about in this chapter is, well, teachers struggle because their kids are forced to be there and so you have to they're not making the choice to want to be there to learn or to be taught so you have this you have to overcome this barrier but if you're controlling them at every turn then you're not doing anything to make them want to be there um and to change that narrative so then that's just perpetuating a problem that makes it more difficult and less beneficial for both teachers and students and it's placing all the power in the hands of the teachers and not giving the students any say in what the, what is happening and that I think I think this is all it feels all very circular to me that we're kids don't want to be there because we're making it an environment that they don't want to be there for but the teachers then kind of are struggling to make it a space that they want to be there for because there's all these pressures from reform and success that don't fall in line with why kids would want to be there and so then we go into why are teachers resisting all this educational reform and um Labrie's supporting teachers and saying they figure out what works for them and they they're the ones in the classroom with these kids day in and day out and so they're hesitant teachers tend to be hesitant to change things because they found a system that works for their kids and why are they going to veer off from that um and on page 141 is where we start talking about emotional neutrality in a lot of professions that teaching and education simply can't have. If you, you know, all of, he's saying all of the success of learning in a classroom comes from having these personal relationships with your kids and knowing your kids. And so how do you have the, you can't, you have to remain a professional, but you, you do blur the lines of professional and personal um, in teaching than you probably do in some other professions because that's the nature what the nature of what we're doing is very inherently emotional i think um and so on then on that note though he makes it clear he's like yes teachers develop these teaching personas and on page 144 that all teachers establish different ways of connecting with their students and but the most effective do indeed make this connection in some form or another which i think um i found encouraging that you know you don't necessarily not every kid's gonna like you but you've and I definitely had teachers that I maybe didn't like, but I respected and I did what they asked me to because I knew I respected who they were and we had a connection, even if it was not a friendly connection. Um, so I think that is important to remember. Um, and then he continues saying he's that on page 149, I highlighted a huge chunk of this saying that about what teachers are normally doing behind these closed doors and how much they're dealing with in those spaces. And um, they, they don't really have a guidebook. So, you know, you develop this teaching persona, you figure out what works in your classroom, and you, you're dealt with accommodations and making the kids do all the standardized testing and keeping all of them um, safely in one room and dealing with all of their emotions on top of actually trying to teach the curriculum that when you're getting all these reforms put on your shoulders to then deal with that on top, it just feels kind of overwhelming and it's teachers deserve this autonomy, but then 
with that autonomy that they're given, they're kind of getting pressures from all different directions. And it seems that he believes most good teachers tend to side with wanting to help their kids and then not really following these reforms. So um, he goes to on page 156, we're talking a little bit more about why teachers are resisting reform. And sorry, I'm trying to find the page in my book. And he says it struggles because these reformers are far from the classroom. And he said there's this, there's a difference in between the teacher's understanding of education versus the reformer's understanding of education. And with my limited knowledge, like I said at the beginning, of what reform is, I think that's where we're running into. And I'm sure that that's not some enlightening point to make. But when you're that far removed from what's actually happening in the classroom, how can you make these reforms? And so I don't know that I really have a solution um but what's happening from what i'm gathering from i know i spent a lot of time talking about chapter five but reformers are getting frustrated because teachers aren't doing what they're the reformers are asking but teachers are then getting frustrated with the reformers because they're asking things that aren't realistic for the context of their classroom and how do we you know we're basically on page 161 he's like we're canceling out any good that's trying to happen like nothing is moving forward because their both parties are just like kind of standing firm in their camps of what they believe is best and I don't really know where you go from there because I do believe that you know there does need to be some sort of governing body over all of these I forget the number all of these individual school districts there does need to be some level of like this is what we are trying to accomplish while still giving teachers enough room to to teach and um, to help their students learn and to sh shift that that teaching and learning can once again be the same thing um, and not have that great distinction there but I don't know how we do that with reform because the you know part of his title is saying this zero sum game of public schooling we're not moving forward right now we're stuck and people are getting frustrated on um, the every side every which way right now and it's I think both parties in terms of like teachers and reformers then aren't taking to the time to like understand what is trying to happen maybe again i don't know enough what happens at the reformer level to really speak to that or to speak to why i think that's a problem um i think i can see the frustration that teachers feel because i'm more familiar with that side of things but i don't think everything reformer i is are doing is wrong but I think right now it's just not working. Um, so I don't know. I have I have been left with a lot of questions, and I'm still trying to make sense of where I think reform should fit into education. But that's where I'm at right now.